Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yatihi allahu falamu dhilla lahu wa man yudlilhu falahadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praises due to Allah from whom we seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our own bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner, and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. O ye who believe, be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamdana innaka anta al-alimul hakeem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqtatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. So uh, today you probably saw that our topic is on this concept of with great power comes great responsibility. And for those of y'all who may have seen the Juma announcement or the, the flyer, probably saw the picture of Spider-Man and we're thinking like, what's this superhero comic book character doing uh, on Juma and in, in this uh, in this khutbah exactly. But just a little bit of background. Uh, so I've been watching the Spider-Man movies recently with uh, with my wife Sarah uh, in an effort to get her caught up to all the uh, you know Marvel superhero movies. And we're now we were on the uh, Spider-Man movies just just this past couple of weeks. And um, you know, in 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 watching the, the the recent movies, we also have been watching the older ones that that I kind of grew up with for the past two decades. Um, and so. Uh, as we were watching this and as, as we as we went through each movie, it was very interesting to me this this concept that was lifted up of with great power comes great responsibility and I couldn't help but think about maybe the possible connections that this has with respect to our faith but um, with, without beleaguering the point, you know, uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, you have Spider-Man or Peter Parker, who's just a kid, someone who's in high school, who, uh, you know, is, is is kind of a misfit. He's kind of awkward. He's shy. Um, he's, he, he's, you know, he's just kind of, he's on the periphery. He's not someone who's uh, in, in center stage or anything like that. He's, he's not a popular kid. He's just, you know, just regular, but uh, very smart. Um, but again, someone who's just on the side here and uh, essentially stumbles upon uh, his his powers, his his, his uh, newfound identity as Spider Man by by essentially by accident, not not really too much by choice. That he's bitten by a spider and uh, gains super strength, is able to you know have uh, these abilities to walk on uh, you know the side of a building and and do all this stuff like a spider does, uh, but as a human and and having all these super abilities. Uh, but it's very interesting to note that. You know, there's obviously the initial excitement of this transformation uh, that he's he's found is like this is really cool. Like you know that I'm able to do all of these different things, but he soon finds that he's he wrestles with it. That uh, he he feels that this 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 uh, res this gift that he's been given, this uh, these abilities he's found, become somewhat like an unwanted burden. Um, he notices how uh, these these gifts that have that have been given to him, that he he's you know imbued with, uh, they begin to set him apart from others. That he 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 has this longing to just want to be a regular kid, just kind of fit in with everybody, just kind of do what everybody else is doing, and uh, it's very interesting to see how he's not only you know in his own personal sense feeling distance and, and feeling away uh, and unable to assimilate with the people around him because of uh, his abilities but similarly uh, he's being ridiculed for it uh, many people uh, are ostracizing him especially the media calling him things like spider menace or freak because of his abilities and how uh, you know he he, he may has the potential to harm these people, even though he he doesn't do that. He he's he's someone that brings a lot of good uh, to society, but uh, it, he can't help but become the pariah for uh, and the outcast uh, for 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 the the narratives that are there. And so, uh, what's very interesting is this concept of with great power 
comes great responsibility uh, is actually imparted to him by his uncle Ben, um, someone who's like a father figure to him. And uh, his uncle doesn't know that he's Spider-Man, but he sees that his that his uh, nephew is going through a number of changes that naturally as a teenager, you know, becomes a uh, full adult. Uh, they are going through not just physical changes, but they are uh, becoming uh, more aware of certain things. They're becoming more capable of certain things. They're developing. So he's recognizing and he's acknowledging that, hey, as you're becoming more powerful in a sense, as you're growing up, as you're recognizing your different abilities and the things that you're able to do, you are also uh, going to recognize that, uh, with this great power, with these new things and these new gifts you're getting, uh, comes great responsibility. And what's really tragic is that as Peter is wrestling with this and and you know just just changing because of his uh, his newfound powers, uh, he ends up making some choices that inevitably uh, lead to and in, in, inadvertently lead to the death of his uncle. So he can't help but feel responsible for causing this. But such a traumatic and difficult event is actually a watershed moment for him as he recalls his uncle's final advice to him of being that with great power comes great responsibility. He recognizes that as Peter Parker, as Spider-Man, he has the ability to not just uh, change himself, but he has the ability to change lives around him. He has the ability to change the world around him. And so because of his powers, he can do what other people can't do. And he's able to help those who most need it. And he's able to uh, transform um, not just himself, but everything that is around him. But it's very interesting to see that recognizing this degree of responsibility, it took overcoming a difficulty, a trauma, and a substantive loss that enabled this awakening for him. But now, fast forward to us right now. Uh, when we, why, why are we talking about Spider-Man? Why are we talking about Peter Parker and superhero powers in a khutbah? Uh, I lift this up that similarly for Muslims, we may see Islam and our faith as a burden. We may see Islam as something that uh, is difficult or unwanted at times. We're at the doorstep for Ramadan and uh, fasting can feel so difficult for us, especially because it breaks us out of maybe the routines we've set or it's just, uh, it's a physical toll upon us. Um, even apart from that, we have certain aspects of Islam that uh, set us uh, inherently apart in certain situations from the norm of society. Having to step aside to uh, uh, honor our prayers, abstaining from things like alcohol and pork and different things that are maybe considered normative in other spaces, but carving that out and marking ourselves as different. And uh, we, like I said, internalize that we are inherently different because uh, of this. And we sometimes see ourselves as less and see ourselves as uh, holding this burden that is known as a faith or known as Islam. But apart from that, similarly to how Spider-Man had the challenge, we also have this challenge of the public media or some of the public outcry being against us as well, that the media may call us menaces or people uh, who are not so familiar with Islam may uh, throw different slurs at us, treating us as threats, treating us, treating us as outcasts, as people who are incompatible uh, with a belief system that is incompatible with how the values of this society are uh, and causing us to inherently feel different. So not only we, we may see Islam as a burden, but we may uh, not feel it in, in so many different ways. And so regardless of if we are people who were born as Muslims and brought up as Muslims and whether, you know, that, that, and that awakening came to you just early on, or, you know, that, that, that came on a little bit later, or if you stumbled upon Islam recently, or it stumbled upon you, what we can come to a very common denominator is seeing the transformative ability of this faith and the ability of this faith to actually be a superpower of sorts. Now, what is a superpower? Uh, we, we recognize a, that a superpower is something that uh, is that we can see as different. It's transformative. Um, it makes a change. Um, it's something that other people don't have, uh, but it causes them to be able to do um, some really great things. And so with Spider-Man having, you know, spider sense and spider uh, kind of like the super strength, you have Superman flying and having super strength, you have the flash running and all this different stuff. Uh, you see these superpowers, but a superpower is it operates twofold in that it uh, not only brings in a new quality, 
that, uh, that, that kind of helps the person to transform and helps them bring something to that society to themselves that they previously did not have. But it also acts on the other end in terms of enhancing what you already have. It, it lifts up the gifts that you have already been given uh, and helps to uh, bring those into the center stage and helps to guide your superpowers from being something that can be used as tools for abuse and tools for harm to tools for good. And so recognizing additionally that our, our gifts are not inherently what uh, are uh, defining us, that we might, as Spider-Man did, lose our abilities at a certain point, but that doesn't mean that we're not Spider-Man anymore. That doesn't mean we're not superheroes anymore. Our, our gifts and who we are, our identity is inherent to us. Similarly, uh, in the movie Encanto, uh, you have this aspect of your, your gifts defining you, when in actuality, uh, it is the that commonality and coming together that your, your gifts make you a part of something even greater. And so as Muslims, each of us, whether we're converts, whether we're born Muslim, wherever we might be, uh, Islam will meet us at different spaces wherever we are and give us a different set of gifts. And so similarly, we come to the table, uh, we come into life, we come to our spaces, bringing these different gifts, not defined by how we've been changed by this, but by the capacity that we're able to um, use these gifts to transform ourselves and the world around us. And we know that this is a faith of transformation. We know that this is a faith that turns hearts and transforms souls. It's a faith that has turned people who are drug peddlers and dealers into people who are defenders of the faith like Malcolm X. It is a faith that turns people who buried their daughters into people who uh, give other people life. It's turned people who led people astray and blocked them from being able to pray or express their faith to people who led people to prayer and to lead them to the faith. And it turned people who were afraid or, or, or not able to stand up on their own feet or stand up for what was right into those who were the uh, standard bearers for fearlessness uh, and so on. You can go on with this. But similarly for us, again, wherever we might come from, wherever we may have encountered Islam, it can be and it is transformative. It can be a superpower or it can be this abil super ability. The Quran tells us in Surah Al Imran that you are the best community. You addressing the Muslims are the best community raised for the good of humanity. You enjoin in what is right, you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah. So for us as Muslims, after we take that shahada, we can't just go on now just seeing ourselves as uh, average Jane and Joe, uh, or like uh, Joe and Jane. We can't just see ourselves as just um, just a regular um, uh, individuals that you know have the same responsibilities as everyone else. We recognize instead that as Muslims, we were uh, are called by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the best community raised for the good of humanity. Not just, hey, you're the best community, good job for you that you're Muslims, but you have a reason why you are the best because you are raised for the good of humanity. You're raised to do something. Uh, you're not just there just to you know, uh, earn your stripes and, 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 and eat your cake and not worry about anybody else's welfare. You're there to help other people. And so it doesn't mean that we inherently see ourselves as better than anyone else or see anybody less than us, but that we lift uh, everybody else and we have this responsibility to take care of those around us. As the Quran says that uh, we were created as khalaifa, we were created as khalifas on this earth, as stewards to take care of this world, to take care of the environment, to take care of the people, to take care of ourselves, and to take care uh, of the religion and the faith that has been given to us. So as I mentioned, whether we are uh, Muslims that, that are uh, new to the faith, born to the faith, or wherever we may have encountered it, uh, we have the blessing of being able to uh, inherit these superpowers, not in a uh, vacuum or, you know, in an un, uh, kind of undefined path. We, we are following in the footsteps of uh, our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, uh, who had modeled not just what it's like to be able to utilize these powers, utilize this faith for good in the community, for not just the 23 years of his life, 
but for the 40 years that he had lived in his community beforehand. So as I mentioned, like, like superpowers and like superheroes, uh, great power brings great responsibility. Islam as a faith has a great power, um, but great powers also have the opportunity to be utilized in ways that bring great harm. That's why great power brings great responsibility, because if that great responsibility is not taken, that great power can be used to hurt other people. And so um, as a Muslim, we have the power we have the power to change someone's life, to change someone's world, to change our own life and our own world and the, the, the place around us for the better or for the worse. And so when we use this responsibly, we are able to not just uh, make it an, an, an improved situation, we're able to transform and, 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 and live into our purpose. As the Prophet as and we're, we're going to inshallah go through this in a way that the Prophet uh, would have led. And when we think about conceptualizing that, okay, if Islam is this kind of superpower, if I do have been imbued with these superpowers, how do I use my superpowers? What we recognize is that just like Spider Man, just like some of these superheroes, that the power comes to you, it may come to you, you know, in that moment or in that instant. But to be able to discern your role, to be able to bring proper benefit, to recognize who you are, to properly hone and refine uh, the use of your power for uh, a real good, it takes time. It takes a process, which is why the Prophet ﷺ, uh, brought this faith and, and taught this faith, not in an instant, just like that, but in a 23-year in a transformative process. But how did he do that? He first started off the baseline by just being a good person. His community knew him as a Sadiq and Al Amin long before he they knew him as Rasulullah, long before they knew that this was the person who God was speaking to, uh, or long before that they you know, chided him as someone who's majnoon, as someone who is uh, you know crazy or bewitched or uh, possessed or anything like that. Now that he is uh, that he was someone who at the least was trusting someone who they could trust, who was honest. So regardless of who he was uh, at, at the time of prophethood, they knew him as at least this baseline. So for us, seeing that the Prophet ﷺ was someone who people could depend on, whether they became his enemies or not, um, that they had this initial respect because of his character and him lifting up this aspect that I have not come for anything but to perfect uh, character, that we see the importance of behavior and good moral and character uh, in, in the Prophet's teaching and in Islam's teaching, that uh, as, as the Prophet came, he, he, for, he didn't come just as uh, an angel out of the sky and teaching them, uh, teaching the people around them a message that was completely foreign to them and as someone who was completely foreign to them. He was someone who built trust, built relations within the community, he took care of the orphan, he fed, fed the widow, he provided shelter to the needy, did all of these things, was an involved member of his community, but at the end of the day was just a good person. So regardless of who we are, what we might have done uh, prior to today, there's, it's never too late to become a good person. So it, it, you will probably have to own up to the things that we might have done that were wrong. We may have to answer to the people who we wronged and correct those things. And that's part of this process. But to change yourself and to say that, uh, to change your trajectory to be a good person is something everybody is capable of with Islam or without Islam. That is something you're capable of. Islam will only help enhance it. As we said, superpowers uh, not only introduce something new, but at their root, they help to enhance what is already there. Uh, we think of Captain America, uh, again, Marvel movie, but um, you know, you, you have this, this concept where it's not the strength that defines Captain America, but his heart, because that's what the superpowers and the super serum amplify is his, his good heart and his ability to do good. It all comes back to what is inherently here. So recognizing that Islam will amplify what is already here, uh, but to change that for what is good. So how do we do this? Dr. Ferdi Al Salam of uh, the American Islamic College AIC in Chicago uh, presented a really uh, thought-provoking and beneficial presentation on uh, the um, spiritual care as, as, as the Prophet uh, would go about. So 12 principles of spiritual care uh, through the Prophet lens uh, for the Association of Muslim Chaplains uh, at a conference I attended earlier on. Um, and this approach I feel is absolutely applicable for us as just Muslims uh, navigating our own faith, how, it how we relate to it, and how it relates to the world around us. So when we see our faith as a superpower, how do we use that? Because like I said, you have to refine it, you have to prepare it. Um, it's something that you have to work on as much as you 
work on out outside. So as much as Spider-Man is practicing to sling webs or fighting other people that are bad guys um, and, 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 you know, working on that aspect, also controlling his anger, controlling uh, your emotions and being able to, uh, you know, work on the internal as much as you do the external. How do we do that? These are 12 principles, inshallah. So it's a good list of principles, but 12 principles by which we work on. So inshallah, let's run through them. First and foremost, do no harm. The Prophet ﷺ said, la dharar wa la dirag, that do no harm and don't reciprocate harm. That if we're hurting someone because of our faith, we are doing it wrong. We don't want to push anybody from faith because of the way that we are practicing faith. So we might not agree with how certain people are practicing their faith, but that the least we want to keep them connected and our faith should not be a tool for harm. Uh, Dr. Feriel potently lifts up that if you are uh, pushing people out of faith, it is something that which we will be accountable for, much like uh, a careless doctor is going to be held accountable for causing uh, injury uh, due to negligence. So realizing that we are accountable, as uh, the Prophet ﷺ, um, has, has taught us that we are uh, folks that are uh, responsible for one another, for our uh, neighbors, that Muslims are those who uh, the people around them are safe from their hands and from their tongues, that a Muslim or a believer is not someone uh, who goes to their uh, to goes to uh, bed full while their neighbor goes hungry, that a Muslim is intimately and deeply involved with the well-being of those around them. Number two, meeting people where they are, not where we think they should be. The Prophet ﷺ spoke to people according to their level of understanding, and we can see that in how he treated uh, each and every one of the people who came to him as uh, their spiritual capacity, as their needs um, necessitated, and didn't just give a one, uh, one size fit all approach for everybody, though Islam set some basic benchmark standards, uh, he never overburdened someone beyond their capacity. You have stories of Bedouins who were told of uh, the five pillars basically being practiced would be their key to Jannah. And you see the process of talk to some of his companions saying that if they left any bit of any of these, it would be a grave sin. So how he met people where they were, rather than just seeing them uh, as all in one, one kind of stock. So lifting that up. Thirdly, connecting before we correct. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, absolutely modeled this, that we should know one another prior to even engaging in trying to correct someone. It's very easy for us to see the faults in our siblings and our brothers and sisters and seeing them do something wrong or what we perceive as wrong, and then to jump to try and correct them. But oftentimes in that correction, as well-meaning and as well-intentioned it might be, will probably push them away or could push them away. So we want to approach in connecting before correcting. There's a story of the Prophet ﷺ that we may have shared prior where the Prophet ﷺ, uh, has a gentleman that comes up to him and says, Ya Rasulullah, permit me to commit zina. And the people around him act like how we would and, and, and they react and say like, what's wrong with you? Be quiet. Like, you know, that's a ridiculous question to ask. The Prophet ﷺ had every right to tell this person that, you know, that's a pretty ridiculous thing to ask for. That's a stuck for the you That's haram. Like, why would you even ask that? And just uh, end the matter there. Rather, the way the Prophet engaged this person is a teaching moment for how we can connect before we correct. The Prophet sat this brother down and asked him, said, okay, um, is that something that, how would you feel if that was the case with your mother, with your sister, with uh, so on and so forth, and goes down the list of relations and sees how that person says, no, I would not want that for my mother. And he connects it back to the, to the people around him that they wouldn't want that either. And slowly goes through each of this by the time that he's at the end of the list. Uh, the, the, the person not only has a complete transformed change of heart, but the Prophet ﷺ teaches him a lesson that love for your brother, what you want for yourself. And he sits, he puts his hand on him and he prays for him that he gives this, he connects with him in a moment where he could have easily corrected, puts him to the side, but instead he sits with him, creates a teaching moment, and that person is better for it, as well as the community around him sees that uh, they're changed. So this is that superpower. This is that superpower in action that he has the power to change someone's life. He had the power to do the exact opposite as well, but he used that power in a way that not only benefited that person, but everybody around him and up until this day. Number four, keeping things simple. Islam is neither hard nor is it harsh. The Prophet ﷺ taught his uh, emissaries who would go to preach Islam or to teach Islam to make things easy, to not make things difficult, to give good news and to not turn things, uh, think, to not turn people away. Number five, 
be flexible, be diplomatic, be easygoing, be, be someone who, as the Prophet Sallam was, in, in this case, being someone who would sit with people rather than try and pull them to where we think they should go. The Quran in Surah Al Imran lifts up that, so by the mercy of Allah, you, O Muhammad, وسلم, you were lenient with them. And if you were rude with them in speech, if you were harsh in your heart, they would have abandoned you. So lifting up this concept of how the Prophet ﷺ was not hard of heart, was not rude in his speech, and that's what invited people and kept them with him, as opposed to them leaving, that this harsh behavior, this, this harsh tongue and this uh, sternness, in a sense, would have deterred people from him, but it wasn't. Number six, teaching and advising people and giving them learning uh, of Islam, teaching them Islam in installments that they can handle and in a way that they can handle. We talked about how Islam was a step-by-step -step process. It was a 23-year enterprise uh, of holistic change, not just theological change. It was a marathon. It wasn't a sprint. It was something that, uh, that, that was not intended to overwhelm people. It's something they couldn't handle. So similarly, it was something that lifted up people uh, as, it, uh, as it was brought about, that it transformed people, and it was a process. The Prophet some lifted up the fact that uh, a person who recites the Quran beautifully and masterfully has the reward of being in the company of the scribes and the angels and lifted up about the person who uh, stumbles, struggles, and just crawls and scrapes through, you know, word by word and just tries to make that effort that that person would have double the reward because it's the journey. It's the way that you could travel that journey, not uh, in effect, how you're just going through and, uh, you know, just, just you, you've just perfected it in a sense. It's about that struggle. Uh, it's about the effort and the intention uh, and not just that, that end result. It is about how you get through there and that, that is lifted up. And so recognizing that Islam too was something that came in a process. And when we teach Islam to people nowadays, it's usually in the binds of a book, it's usually a document, it says, go memorize this, change yourself overnight but not recognizing it took 23 years for some people and even longer to be able to get it right. It must be something that is culturally relevant. Not only does Islam meet people where they are spiritually, it meets them where they are culturally, contextually, wherever they may be in the world, whether they are in Southeast Asia, they're in Europe, they're in Africa, or they are in America, it meets them where they are cross-culturally. That it, Islam didn't come and say, this is a uniform Islamic culture that came about. Islam came to different societies, and instead of introducing an Islamic garment, it brought in this garment of modesty, this, this idea of certain principles and, and align them on that star, but it still allowed them to maintain that diversity uh, of culture and of, of the different nations and peoples, which is uplifted in the Quran, that they may know one another. Number eight, thinking uh, about the long term, having a vision for ourselves. Again, I've probably been talking more about others than I have ourselves, but thinking about yourself as well as others in each of these things, but thinking about the long-term goal. Don't just think that, okay, I haven't been able to pray properly for the last week or so, or I haven't been able to get it in, in the sense I'm beyond redemption, or I cannot get it right, uh, not to see the short the short side of it. Again, remembering, it's a long game. It's it's about the marathon. 23 years. Think of it in, in, in stepwise fashion. Don't think of this as a sprint up a mountain. This is a hike that you are going to climb uh, gradually. So looking at it, not in a sense of just how little progress you might have made in the short run, but see how far you can go in the long run. Number nine, have an arc. Work with affection, respect, and compassion for those who you serve. So work with an arc for yourself, having affection, respect and compassion for yourself and for those around you. Number 10, don't seek any personal gain. In your superpower and as the superheroes, uh, we lifted up Spider-Man, they're not doing it for fortune and fame. They're not doing it for the recognition of other people. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And in our case as Muslims, not uh, you know living out our faith for not any personal gain or to be recognized by the media or to get any kind of like attention there, but to simply do so because it's the right thing to do and because we are just seeking God's pleasure. That's the only reason. Um, and, and, and in and of itself, that has its own uh, infinite benefits, but not to be uh, driven by any kind of personal material gain that we might get uh, because of our faith, but rather seeing the pleasure that we can get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 11, honoring the sacred worth, dignity, confidentiality, and uh, the, the uh, inherent flawedness of each of us. 
um, especially of our fellow brothers and sisters, that our faults, our sins, our mistakes, and our, uh, our, our, our weak shortcomings are not those that define us, that we are, we are able to get past that. We are able uh, to do so much more, that we are, we are defined not by those mistakes, we are defined by how we can work through them, but not to be someone who seeks out the faults of others, not to be someone who covers our own faults by exposing someone else's, but to be people who cover the faults of other people, to help to grow together, rather than uh, to simply live life in a sense of calling someone out, making them feel bad, and making ourselves feel better. Again, Islam is not brought to cause harm. It's not brought to subjugate some people and lift other people up. It's brought for every one of us to lift one up together. Lastly, being humble. The Prophet ﷺ was someone who sat in his gatherings, emissaries would come uh, and from other countries, other empires, and they would come upon the crowd of Muslims. They'd say, which one of you is Muhammad? Because they couldn't recognize him. Um, so seeing that you're, you're one of the people, you're not apart from the people, but you're acting as a model of, of, of paragon for these people to help uh, uplift them all together. Um, that you are not someone who uh, stands apart from them in a way that makes them feel excluded or uh, just, you know, and in, in, in creates that distance. You're someone who stands apart for the reason that you are helping to bring them uh, up with you. Um, that as the Prophet ﷺ lifted up, that the person is not a, a Muslim is, is someone who leaves a place better than they found it. A Muslim is someone uh, whose hand and tongue other people are safe from. A Muslim is someone who uh, whose stomach uh, is not someone whose stomach uh, is filled while their neighbor goes uh, unfilled. So looking at this aspect of social welfare as well. Um, and as the Quran says, with respect to being humble, that the servants of the most merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. And when the ignorant address them, when people around the society call you towel head or, or insult your hijab or call you names because of your faith or call you uh, call your religion something or call your prophet something when you're when the media insults your faith or treats you as a threat or puts a crosshair on your back or asks you whether your values are compatible with the society in which you live in uh, or asks all these things that cause you to doubt or make you feel that your faith is a burden that your uh, identity is a burden that your religion is a burden that uh, who you are in a sense is, is, is something that is utterly different that in response to this they say peace they say not just words of peace they say salam and they respond with their in their with their islam with salam salam is not just a statement that is given salam is a way of life salam is an action salam is a way of making your community better salam is a way of transforming the lives around you in a peaceful way in a peaceful way that brings about uh, transformative change, that brings about substantive change, regardless of what is hurled at you, the insults that are hurled at you, the inside voice that tells you maybe Islam isn't it, maybe this is too much, maybe you aren't good enough for it. This is the this is what we respond. We respond with salam, salam, because uh, Allah's name is as salam. From Allah is peace. And Allah is peace. And so we, uh, we are agents of salam. We are agents of peace. We are uh, in this religion of Islam to give uh, salam. And so as we conclude here, inshallah, we ask that Allah enable us, that Allah enable us to see our superpowers in, in, in our faith, to see our faith as a superpower, that we may have seen it as a, uh, as a difficulty. It may have felt uh, as a burden, but that at its root, at its core, it is something that will allow us to transform lives for the benefit of society. It will allow us to transform ourselves for the benefit of society and allow us to lift up all that is around us without harming anybody. We allow, we ask Allah to enable us to realize that not just the powers that we possess are indeed powers and not, not, not just mere uh, creeds or mere beliefs, but we need powers. And that it, Allah allows us to use these powers responsibly, not in a way that harms, and helping those around us, the world around us, and ourselves, regardless of who we are, where we're from, or when we came to Islam. And we ask Allah to strengthen our hearts, our minds, our souls, and enable us to realize the potential of this power, the value of this faith, and this religion, and the responsibility that each and every one of us has to each other, to ourselves, and ultimately to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
And we ask lastly that Allah make this journey for us one of ease, one that is not isolated and one that gives benefit to those well after uh, we are gone. Like that, like the person who plants a tree and the fruits bear for generations to come, even after that person passes, or like the person who creates a well and that uh, well gives water for generations much longer than that person is along, uh, is around to see. So we ask Allah to grant this for us. Rabbana wa taqabal dua, Rabbana taqabal minna, inna ka'anta samiul alim, or our Lord, accept this from us, accept this prayer, for thou art all hearing. All knowing. Jazakallah khair, Jumma Mubarak, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.